<clears throat> there have been a lot of people uh, over the years who have sought or tried to create heaven on earth, the concept of a perfect society or an ideal uh, town or kingdom. Uh, hermits concluded that the best bet for that was to go live by themselves out in the middle of nowhere. Of course, they took themselves with themselves, and that, that kind of ruins it. Monks thought, you know what, monks and nuns, if we live in a separate uh, community, we can run it a certain way, and we can fix things, and we can make things better. And they certainly did have a fairly good society there, but it wasn't heaven on earth. The Essenes tried the same thing in the first century. The Jewish uh, uh, radicals, they moved out by the Dead Sea. They held all of their goods in common. They had very strict rules. They thought, maybe we can do it. And that didn't last. And then, of course, you know the story of the pilgrims. Things weren't working well for them in the old world, so they said, what if we go to the new world, and we'll go to a new place, and we'll set up a colony that will run the way it ought to. And so they came to Plymouth. Yet they still had hardships there. That first winter, they barely survived. They still had dissension. People that left the colony, people that fought in, um, in the colony amongst themselves. And of course, that thing, the Salem Witch Trials. They, they may have had some issues there. Heaven on earth is seemingly impossible. Nobody can find it. Geographically or governmentally or societal changes, we just can't seem to make it happen, and there's a good reason. Everyone seeking it is preempting the will of God, getting out ahead of what God is doing because the kingdom of God is not yet here. But we're going to talk about the kingdom of God today, because Jesus has something to say about the kingdom of God. So let's take a look. Mark chapter 4, 26 to 34. We'll start with 26. He says, he also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. So we're going to learn today what the kingdom of God is like. But before we figure out what it's like, we better make sure we understand what it is. What is the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 1, verse 5, we saw this phrase already. John the Baptist said, The kingdom of God has drawn near. Repent and believe the good news. Throughout the gospel of Mark, the kingdom of God is represented as, as being something mysterious, something that only those who can quote-unquote see and quote-unquote hear can find. It's here already. John the Baptist said, repent, it's near. Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. It's, it's apparently here, yet not what it is going to be. It's, it's here, but not yet here. It's attacked now. It faces enemies and difficulties now, but the scriptures tell us that it will ultimately be victorious. But what is it? In essence, the kingdom of God is the reign of God, R-E-I-G-N, not R-A-I-N, the reign of God. His plans, his purposes as they unfold. And so when John the Baptist said the kingdom of God is near, it's because God's plan was unfolding in their generation with the coming of the Messiah. And then when Jesus came, he said the kingdom of God is at hand because, hello, I'm here. And so it, culminated, it came to a crescendo with Jesus, and then with Pentecost, and then continues on to this day. The kingdom of God is God working in our world. So it is not a literal kingdom. It is literally not a literal kingdom. It's not geographically located. You can't go there. But it's not just in heaven. There's a lot of contrast with this concept. It is not here now on this earth, but it's not just wait for heaven. It's not don't worry about it now when you're dead, it, that'll be a thing. 
It's here too. It will become associated with the church. And the church will be working the, the plan of God and the will of God as much as we are able. But it's not limited to the church. Because sometimes God works outside of the church. Sometimes God works with people that don't fit in very well in the church. It's more than just the church. Because it encompasses every human being whose heart has been made whole by the redemption of Jesus Christ. That's more than just the church. <clears throat> it's most manifested. We see the kingdom of God most clearly when the people of God are acting as servants, when they're loving their neighbors, when they're praying for their enemies. There we see the kingdom of God. We see God at work. When the kingdom of God is faced with hostility, even violence, it does not respond in kind. It does not respond with its own force. Instead, it conquers with forgiveness and love. So it goes, grows through the gospel proclamation. It grows through the discipleship of the followers of Jesus Christ. When we preach the gospel, when we internalize the word of God and obey it, then the kingdom of God is growing and advancing. So long story short, that was quite a bit of explanation, the kingdom of God is God doing what God has promised that God will do. God does this through Jesus and through the Holy Spirit for the sake of fallen humanity. So there we have the kingdom of God. So just in case we're not clear, the kingdom of God is not, and I have to clear this up because I see people talking as if this were the case all the time, the kingdom of God is not Christendom. Christendom is the word for all of those nations and peoples where Christianity is a majority. Europe, back in the day, was considered Christendom. Christendom versus Islam, for hundreds of years they fought. That was not the kingdom of God, because they certainly did not act and interact in a way consistent with the kingdom of God. Read about the Crusades sometimes, and you'll realize that that was certainly not the kingdom of God when they slaughtered the inhabitants of Jerusalem. It was not the kingdom of God when they ransacked Constantinople and destroyed a thousand-year-old Christian city. They were not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is also not the United States of America. Hope that does not burst any bubbles. But we are not the kingdom of God because we do not fully manifest what God is doing in this world. And sometimes we as a nation are working against what God is doing in this world. We have never been the kingdom of God and we will never be the kingdom of God as a nation because we are not all of what God is doing in this world and we are not exclusively doing what God is doing in this world. And by the same token, lest you think I'm being hard on just one particular country, the church is not the kingdom of God either. Because the kingdom of God is greater than all of these human things that I can imagine. Even the church established by Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, is not fully the kingdom of God. If we were, we would be without the evil that still resides within Christendom, within America, within the church. We would be without our shortcomings and our faults and our failures. So we are certainly not fully the kingdom of God. But yet it is here. It is amongst us. For Jesus and the gospel are certainly still working toward that finale that we saw in Revelation 21 in our opening scripture, when there is a new heaven and a new earth, when the new Jerusalem descends, then the kingdom of God will be fully what it is meant to be. But what is it like now? That's what we're going to look at this morning. Here's our first parable. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the, the soil produces grain, 
First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. So we already had the parable of the sower a few weeks ago. This is a little bit different, because in the parable of the sower, we were talking about the farmer throwing the seed everywhere, right, even on the path and amongst the rocks. That was interesting. And we were talking about how some of the ground was good and some of the ground not so much. But here... The real thing that needs to be noted is the seed itself. So what then does this little, short, unique parable, because Mark is the only one that has it, tell us about the kingdom of God through our understanding of this seed? Well, the first thing it tells us is that the growth of the seed is steady and relentless. Whether he's sleeping or, do, or not, the seed still grows. That's interesting. The kingdom of God continues to grow. Secondly, the farmer doesn't know what's going on. He's not telling the seed what to do. He's not making the seed do what it does. Thirdly, the growth is ordered. There's a, a plan and a purpose, right? The stalk and then the head and then the kernel. It's going in a purposeful direction. And then lastly, there's a harvest at the end of this. There's a plan that is leading toward a harvest. So these are the four things that I, that I see that jump out about what the kingdom of God is like. We'll try to figure these out. Notice that the farmer in this parable is certainly not God, like it was in the parable of the sower, because here the farmer doesn't understand why it grows. We know God understands why the kingdom of God grows, and we know God is the one that makes the kingdom of God grow through the Holy Spirit. So the farmer is you and me. It's a human perspective on what the kingdom of God is like. We know that there's seed out there, and we know that it's growing, but our understanding is not like God's. So let's look at that. What is the seed? The seed is God working in individual people's lives. That is, it's the gospel going into people's hearts and minds and transforming them. That makes sense. That's not hard. So first thing, that steady, relentless growth. It's interesting to note that we don't know what God is doing in other people's lives, do we? We don't know who's growing and who's not. We don't know who's going in the right direction and who's not. We don't even understand that in our own lives sometimes. You might think you're going in the right direction and making good growth when you're not, or you might think you're not doing anything when God really is working in you. How, when, and where growth is happening is a mystery to us. And I think on one level that's very encouraging, because if it was just up to us, it wouldn't grow very well. If we were in charge and trying to make it happen, we'd screw it up. But because God is directing this, often behind the scenes in ways that we can't see. We have hope for people. We have hope for communities. Secondly, we saw that the farmer was not in charge and he didn't understand it. And that is certainly true because we know enough about the gospel to share it. You and I, we know enough about the gospel to let people know that they need to repent of their sins, that Jesus died for their sins, that he rose again in vindication. We can explain that and people can understand that. But how that all interacts in the human heart and mind with the Holy Spirit and human free will and all of that stuff, I don't know. It's beyond our grasp. We know a little of this and a little of that, but we don't need to know it all because we're not in charge. Thirdly, we talked about that ordered growth. It's fascinating that people come to God from all sorts of directions, young or old, rich or poor, healthy or ill, eager or reluctant, through an intellectual or emotional path. But every person's salvation has the exact same parts to it. Repentance and faith. It is always by grace through faith. No matter how someone comes to a saving knowledge, to a transforming understanding of Jesus Christ and what he has done for you, it's all the same. It might not look like it on the outside. A thousand years ago, the way people came to Christ in different cultures, in different languages, in different classes, 
someone with a difficult past that they're dealing with, someone who's a child that is still somewhat innocent. Those all look different to us. But it's still the same process. Repentance, faith, and the works that are produced afterwards. And then fourthly, the harvest. The end result that is envisioned with each of us is the same. That process of God working in individual lives has the same goal for every one of us. Righteousness. That's a combination of personal transformation and community usefulness. God needs to transform you and make you what you need to be, and then he needs to put you to work. And that is the goal for all of us. And so that is what the kingdom of God is like. A little mysterious, a little relentless, a little bit beyond our understanding, and yet effective and making things happen in our world. We've got one more. Jesus has one more explanation, and we'll tie these two together at the end. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Excuse me. I have no idea how big the rhododendron seeds are, but man, those things get out of control if you don't uh, trim them. I've seen people around here who have them bigger than their house, and you're thinking, you might want to do something about that. That's what a mustard seed, it's a tiny little seed, yet it makes this huge, bushy tree thing. The previous parable told us how orderly and consistent and purposeful the growth of the kingdom of God is. And here we see how explosive that growth can be, how much volume it can contain, how impressive it can be. So what does that mean? Well, I think it means something both individually and collectively. Individually, it means that God can start with just a word, just a moment in someone's life and turn the direction of that entire life around, taking someone from darkness and death to light and life through just a word, just a, just, a, just a moment, just a brief interaction can be the tipping point that you look back and say, there it was. That changed an entire life around. Collectively, God can utilize a small group, just a few sometimes, of dedicated servants and use them as a force to change the world to mold and shape entire societies, to tackle intractable problems. So let me give you a couple of examples from the scriptures and from real life, uh, or from uh, history. First example is an example of an individual. And the one that pump, popped into my mind was from Luke 19, and that's the story of Zacchaeus. You got this man, Zacchaeus, who we picture as being too short to see over the crowd, no idea how big he really was, but he climbs this tree because Jesus is walking by. Tiny little seed. How can that possibly do much of anything? He just climbed a tree. And yet when Jesus walks by, he stops, he talks to the man, he invites himself over for dinner. And by the end of that day, Zacchaeus has given half of everything he owns to the poor, and Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. In one day, because of one tiny action, an entire life was changed. Probably a good thing Jesus invited himself over for dinner, eh? That's the kind of thing that the kingdom of God is like. And here's a slightly different version of that same story. That happened in one day. This one takes decades. You've heard of a song called Amazing Grace. I think you might have heard it, right? If I hum a few bars, maybe you'll remember it, right? Amazing Grace. Some of you know that John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. At 18 years old, John Newton was impressed. Now, you don't know that word the way I'm using it. Impressed means that he was pulled off the street 
and put onto a British warship and forced into the British Navy. It wasn't exactly a voluntary force. They literally gang-pressed. They took a group of guys, they grabbed guys, and put them on the boat and sailed away. For years, John Newton's father was looking for him, had no idea where he was or what was going on. So he was on a British warship, and then he was transferred to a slave ship. And then he himself, for a while, was a slave in Africa. He was rescued from that and then went and worked on other slave ships. He had an initial conversion experience during a storm at sea. He had his own Lieutenant Dan moment yelling at the storm or some such. But he continued working on slave ships with the change being that now he was reading the Bible. Eventually, he retired from the slave trade after he had a stroke. And then after a few more years of trying, he became an Anglican priest. And you're thinking, where's the part where he writes the song? We're still waiting for that. 34 years after he gave up his personal involvement with the slave trade. 34 years. He wrote Thoughts Upon the Slave Trade, an abolitionist pamphlet. In that, he said that he had a confession which came too late. It will always be a subject of humiliation, of, excuse me, of humiliating, reflecting to me that I was once active instrument in a business to which my heart now shudders. He says, my conscience got to me too late. It took too long. At that point, he became an ally of William Wilberforce, and he died only months after Britain outlawed the slave trade in 1807. But that was not the end of slavery in England, just the trade of slaves in, uh, across the Atlantic and whatnot. It was not until 1833 that slavery itself was outlawed in the British Empire. And guess what? William Wilberforce died three days after that passed. That small group of people spent their entire lives fighting against the slave trade. It's a fascinating story. Watch the movie Amazing Grace sometime. It's powerful, very well acted. And both William Wilberforce and John Newton are, in that, are portrayed in that. But notice, it took decades for God to get John Newton where he needed to be. And yet that growth was still going. And what it ended up in the end is absolutely amazing. And it took decades of effort and setbacks and continued efforts for the abolitionists to be successful in England. And then one more example. So we went from individual to group there. Uh, one more example of what a small group of people could do if they had a mind to it. In 1865, William and Catherine Booth founded the... Uh-oh, trivia. Nobody's on it this morning. Anybody? William and Catherine Booth? The Salvation Army. Thank you, Violet. Ding, ding, ding. Get, that, uh, get her a candy bar. In 1865, they started a little something. Now there are 15,000 congregations with 26,000 ministers and uh, 1.65 million members. And they run charitable efforts in 131 countries. I don't think that's what they thought they were starting. But that's what it became. Because they planted a seed and let it grow. And God said, I can use this. You see, when the power of God is at work in people, it will accomplish wonders that are amazing. It will be impressive to behold. More impressive than when that little acorn turns into a giant oak tree all those years later. That's the kingdom of God at work. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He didn't say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. That 
postscript to our text this morning makes me ask the question, how easy is it to understand spiritual matters? Last time we, act, uh, we asked, or recently we asked the question, do people want to know the truth? Do they actually want to know? Here the question is more, can they understand? It's not about do they want, but, but can they? 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul says that without the Spirit of God, we cannot accept the things that come from the Spirit. In other words, in order to understand spiritual things, you need the Spirit of God to enable you to do so. So in that sense, it is not our understanding of spiritual matters that is the primary hurdle. It's not that Jesus spoke in parables that kept anyone from believing. And it's not the fact that spiritual matters are difficult to understand that keeps people from coming to God. Because if they were willing, the Spirit would be there. For those who have faith, for those who have a heart willing to bend to the will of God, when they seek, they will find. When they knock, the door will be opened to them. Those who followed Jesus here in the text, those who were there to hear the explanation, were the willing, were the dedicated, were the disciples. So what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is God at work in our midst. It takes many forms, looks many different ways, but accomplishes what it sets out to do. What does it look like? What does it act like? We saw some explanations. It's steady, it's relentless, it's purposeful, sometimes it's mysterious, but it is always accomplishing the will of God, and the results are always awe-inspiring. 